we'll begin reading at verse 17. I'll read to verse 21, and we'll get into our study. The Apostle Peter writes in uh, chapter 1, 1 Peter, verse 17, And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. So as we begin, let me remind you of a few things we went through last time we were together, because uh, Peter has just given earmarks, if you will, earmarks of one who belongs to the Lord, earmarks of a child of God. He had said that Christians first, they, that we, we Christians gird up our minds, he had stated. Uh, that means that we are ready for action. That speaks of us being serious. And in, in light of the days that these believers were living in, it was important for them to be on the alert. Remember how he had already uh, mentioned that they were going through very difficult things. He had said in verse 6, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. So he's speaking concerning the difficulties that they're experiencing, and they need to be ready for action because there's persecution. We'll be seeing that later on, that they're enduring at this time. And so they need to be ready for action. They need to be on the alert. They need to be serious. And that's what believers who are walking through spiritual minefields, even in this day, need to be aware of. In First Peter, he'll say later on in chapter 4, verse 7, he says, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. If we really believe that we're living in the last days, and I think everybody in this room would, would say that we, we are, and you'd agree with that. If we really believe that, then how then should we live? And so he would say, and he will say, as we'll get there, it's in chapter 4, we'll get there in about a year and a half. But when we get there, he says we need to be serious and we need to be watchful in a spiritual sense in our prayers. And so one, we're to gird up our minds. And then second, he said believers are to be sober. That means calm and collected. That speaks of being temperate. That's because we are aware that we're in a spiritual battle. We're not battling against flesh and blood, but against spiritual forces. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds. And so we need to battle the spiritual battle with spiritual weapons, and we need to be alert to those things. Again, in chapter 5, uh, verse 8 of 1 Peter, he's going to say it like this. He says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And third, he said, we are, uh, as believers, resting our hope in the grace that is brought about by, he says, the revelation of Jesus Christ. So we are awaiting him as he's going to come and uh, we will be with him. It's like what it says in Hebrews 9, 27 and 28, as it is appointed for men to die once. But after this, the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many to those who eagerly wait for him. He will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Those who eagerly wait for him. You know, it's easy for us to get caught up with the things of the world. There are so many temptations and opportunities to, uh, to satiate our flesh. But we need to have an anticipation. We need to be aware of the fact that he's even at the door. And we should be eagerly awaiting him. Another thing he said is we're to live as God's obedient children. Now, obedience to God is to be the earmark of every one of God's children. Jesus said it like this. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. How, he said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? You know, um, obedience is the earmark of a believer, and it's not difficult. God's, God's commands, First John tells us, are not burdensome. They're not grievous. They're actually pleasant. They're pleasing to us. Why? Because in the obedience of those things he's commanded, we have great fellowship with God. And Jesus had said in John 15, verse 10, if you keep my commandments, you'll abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide 
in his love. He went on to say that believers are to be aware of the evil times and to resist being conformed to this age. Being conformed to this age is not simply looking like, because, you know, it's not as, you know, sometimes people have said, and I'll say this quickly, this isn't in my notes, but I'll do it anyway. Because I asked the pastor, and he said it was okay. Um, <laughs> but there was a time uh, when, when, when the church, members of the body of Christ felt that it was more holy to walk around with, with uh, frowns on your face. That it was, uh, it was a mark of carnality for you to laugh or enjoy life. And that was a sad period in the, in the history of the church. Um, and there are others who, who have said, oh, you know, there are certain things you should not do. You know, you don't smoke and you don't chew and you don't date girls who do, that kind of thing. And so it was, it, holiness for them was what they didn't do, not who they are. And so what happens with that mentality is you get caught in legalism. The things that you're not doing make you better than somebody else. Uh, but what we're to do, what we've been called to do, is to be re resisting being conformed to the mentality of this age, having the same values, in other words, that the world has. That's why in Romans 12, uh, Paul had said it in verse 2 like this. He said, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So you're conformed to the, uh, the image of the Lord, not to the world. And so we are to live those holy lives. So all of this is built on the fact that we're God's children. Now, in verse 16, and I'm going to use that kind of like a launching pad, if you will. In verse 16, he had said, be holy for I am holy. Now, by nature, God is holy. Isaiah chapter 6 is a very powerful portion of Scripture. And, and uh, it, verse 3 says, says something I think I, I'd like to quote here. It says, One cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. So since he is holy, he's saying, we too should be set apart from evil because being set apart from evil is the quality of holiness. The word holiness or holy in the original language in Greek, speaks of being set apart. And so we're to be set apart from the evil of the world. We're to be set apart from evil. We're, we're to have no pleasure in it. And uh, because God has no pleasure in the evil of this world, neither should his children have pleasure in the evil of this world. And that's why he says in verse 17, if you call on the Father who without partiality judges. And so I want to note something here. I want you to see this in verse 17. I want you to see how he says, if you call on the Father. That, that is something we New Testament believers, that, that may just go past us. But when you look in the Old Testament, you'll see that there are various titles, descriptions that are given of God when speaking of him. And obviously in the Old Testament, there, will be, there are Hebrew names or Hebrew titles and I'll give you a few of them, not that I know Hebrew, but I'll pretend that I do for your sake. Uh, in the scripture, he is Al Shaddai. Al Shaddai means God Almighty. You see that in Genesis 17. He's called Al Elyon, which means the Most High God, the Supreme God, Genesis 14. He's Al Olam, which is the Everlasting God, Genesis 16. He is Jehovah the self-existing God. He is uh, Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. He is Jehovah Nisi. The Lord is my banner. He is my victory. Jehovah Shalom. The Lord is my peace. He is Jehovah Sabaoth. The Lord of hosts. He is Jehovah Roy. The Lord is my shepherd. We, we know all of those. al Elyon, al Olam, Jehovah, etc. We know those because we've heard them in Bible studies or we've read that in the scripture. And that's the Old Testament. He is these things. He is, he is God Almighty. He is the most high God. He's the everlasting God. He's the self-existing one. And this is how the children of Israel knew their God. For me, and it's really an important thing 
when we look at the New Testament, because the New Testament gives us a deeper sense of who he is. See, again, remember that the children of Israel knew him as almighty, as supreme, as all exist, self-existing, as the God who provides. They knew things about him. But Jesus gave us a different name for him. Jesus told us he's our father. He's our father. He's our father in heaven. And that's why when his men said, uh, were being taught the prayer that he had, he began by saying, our father who art in heaven. He is our heavenly father. And he loves us. And we're his children. And as his children, that's the reason we honor and obey him. I honored and obeyed my father to some degree, not perfectly. And to be honest with you, obviously brought shame to him for quite some time in my life. But I wanted to be different with my God. And when I came to know, and it took a while, I didn't understand at first, I still am growing to understand this, that he is my father. And that honoring him and obeying him is a demonstration of my love for him. Well, that helps me to know as I have come to Christ that it is my responsibility, it's my pleasure, it's my joy to honor the God who is God, and I honor God for who he is. And, and when you honor God for who he is, um, we obey him. We live a way that reveals that we're separated. Listen, if somebody in your job or in your class or in your neighborhood knows you well enough to talk to you, I'm not saying just walks up to you for the first time not knowing you at all. If they work with you or they live near you, or they go to school with you, or they have mutual friends, and so they've been around you. If you have people who come up to you to witness to you, that may be telling you something about the way you're living, right? <laughs> if they're witnessing to you, that might tell you something about the way you're impacting them. I had a guy, I, um, I used to work in a place in Huntington Park, and there was a guy who was a, um, a fellow who, he was a salesman, and he would come in and speak to my, to my supervisor and all. And, and uh, one day my supervisor, his name was Jerry, wasn't, wasn't in the office, and um, the guy came in, and I started sharing the Lord with him. And, uh, and this is a guy who would take my, my, my boss out to Dodger games. And... Uh, my boss would come in after going to the game and he would be pretty drunk because the salesman was buying him a lot of beers. And he'd come back pretty drunk. He did it fairly often. And one day I was talking to this guy and the guy said something to this effect. He said, uh, as I shared with him about the Lord, because I used to take my opportunities while working secular jobs when given opportunity, I would take the opportunity to share the Lord with people. And so I was sharing it with him. And he looks at me and has this kind of, I'll never forget, he had this kind of surprise look in his face. And he just says, David, are you witnessing to me? And I said, yeah, you pagan. I said, yeah. I said well, he goes, he says, I'm a Christian. I'm already a Christian. And I was thinking, you know, I, I wasn't making judgment. And it sounds like I was. I wasn't. I was just surprised. How could you say you're a believer when I know you go? And then he tries to explain to me why he gets my boss drunk. And see, if you've got somebody witnessing to you, well, be aware of that. Be aware of that. Uh, it's not that we're to be perfect, but we certainly need to be aware of who we are. And that's what Peter's trying to tell us. He's saying, listen, you have a father. Your father is in heaven. Your father loves you. We're his children. Therefore, we should honor him. We should obey him. And when we came to, to faith in Jesus Christ, we have learned to give him the honor that a, a, a father deserves. And, and the way that we live is going to reveal... Um, that we really are separated to him. You see, our true relationship with the Lord is revealed by the fruit of our lives, not just the things that we say. When we went through 1 John, remember these things. In 1 John 1, verse 6, John said, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. 
In 1 John 2, verse 4, he who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar. The truth is not in him. 1 John verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 9, he who says he's in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. So we can say one thing, but what we do demonstrates what we really believe. And so when we know the Lord, our lives will be transformed. And instead of desiring the old things of the world, we begin to desire more of God. It's like Paul said in 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1. He said, therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. In our world, there's a great emphasis on something. We see it. It's, it's that emphasis on being authentic. Be yourself. Well, it's important to be real, of course. But when pushed to the extreme, that's really simply narcissism. And the way we habitually live is going to reveal what we truly believe. Because we live out what we believe. Uh, a writer I appreciate, uh, A.W. Tozer, uh, said this. He said, we have learned to live with unholiness and have come to look upon it as the natural and expected thing. And that's taking place. And this was written, you know, many years ago, over 70 years ago, when Tozer said that. It's even worse today. So for the Christian, turning away from the old way of thinking and living is necessary. That's why in 2 Corinthians 6, 17 and 18, Paul said, Come out from among them, be separate, saith the Lord, do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I'll be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. And so he's speaking concerning these things. And he says again in verse 17, If you call on the Father, our Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. So notice how he speaks concerning this. Uh, he speaks of God who, who without partiality judges according, notice in verse 17, according to each one's work. He said God is impartial and he's righteous. God, the scripture says, is not a respecter of persons. In 2 Chronicles 19, 7, there's no iniquity with the Lord our God, no partiality, nor taking of bribes. In 2 Timothy 4, verse 8, there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. God, without partiality, judges according to each one's work. In 2 Corinthians 5.10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he's done, whether good or bad. In Colossians 3.25, he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he's done, and that without partiality. And so God is the one who without, he is a righteous judge, who without partiality will be judging. And so a believer will produce works that reveal that we're saved. That's because good works are the natural result of being saved. Good works are the natural result of turning away from evil. Ultimately, we all stand before the Lord in judgment. Romans 14.10, we all stand before God's judgment seat. Now, for some, it's going to be in judgment for rejection of Jesus Christ and the gospel. Jesus is the judge. And the gospel will be the standard of judgment. In John 5, 22, the father judges no man. He's committed all judgment to the son. John 12, 48, there's a judge for one who rejects me and does not accept my words. That very word which I spoke will condemn him at that last day. By the way, that's why we are so intent on sharing the word of God with people. I'll be sharing something like this. As I'm going through this, I realize that on Sunday, I'll be sharing some very similar things this uh, upcoming Sunday. That doesn't mean you should stay home. I'm just telling you that I'll be sharing some things very similar. But we will be standing before the Lord as believers. But judgment in terms of our eternity has already been decided. When you gave your heart to Christ, your eternity is now settled. You have life in Jesus Christ. When we stand before him, it'll be for us as believers to receive the rewards of our life, the things that we've done. We've been justified. 
And uh, according to Romans 5, 9, we've been justified by his blood. How much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? And so knowing that we appear before Jesus should be the motivation for the way that we live right now. Those who don't know the Lord, and I want you to think about what's going on right now in various universities, what's going on right now in our, in our nation. Those who do not know the Lord have no fear of him. There's no fear of God in their eyes. And I'm seeing, I'm seeing the fruit of that right now. I'm seeing the fruit of people who have no fear of God. And it's something that I think that we need to be really aware of. They don't seek God. They don't fear God. It, it says in Psalm 36, 1, transgression speaks to the ungodly within his heart. There's no fear of God before his eyes. We, on the other hand, we live in what has been called a reverential fear of God. And it's this reverential fear of God that purges or purifies us. In Proverbs 10, 27, the fear of the Lord prolongs days. Proverbs 14, 27, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to turn one away from the snares of death. So the knowledge that God is the final judge is to motivate us, and it motivates us to share our faith. Why? Because Hebrews 10, 31 says, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I'll never forget, I've said this before, and it hasn't been that recent. Some of you may remember, but we had a guy in our church when our church had first begun. I don't think our church was a year old at that time. And uh, his wife was a high school friend of, of Marie, my wife. And so his, his wife began coming to our church, and so he would accompany her when she came. And uh, he wasn't a believer. But I remember after a Sunday morning, I'll never forget, I was standing in the front at Central School, where we used to meet, and he began to speak to me, and, and I enjoyed speaking to people like, you know, who didn't know the Lord, and all. I enjoyed speaking to him, and I didn't know him, so he began just to share with me, but this is something I'll never forget that he said. He said to me, yeah, I know I'm going to go to hell. He said it like that. Yeah, I know I'm going to go to hell, and this nonchalant, and I, I remember looking at him, and he said, but that's okay. All my friends are going too. He said, and we'll just party. And so I shot him. No, I, I. <laughs> See, there's no fear of God in their eyes. They haven't got an idea that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The same ones who, who tremble at, we'll say, at an arresting officer are not afraid of the God who judges for eternity. And to me, that's amazing. And so he's saying, listen, you need to know that your father, without partiality, is going to judge according to each one's work. The believers receive reward, but those who don't know him will ultimately receive condemnation. So he's saying, knowing this, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay or your sojourn here in fear, verse 8, 18, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. So knowing, when he's saying knowing, that means being fully aware of the cost of redemption and being fully aware of what it cost is going to produce love and thankfulness for the salvation he gave us. It's what motivates us with thankful hearts to serve God. We've been redeemed. The word redeemed means to liberate by payment of a ransom. And we've been set free, he's saying, from, notice, empty and aimless lives. And the redemption was not by silver. It wasn't by gold. Why is that? Well, gold and silver doesn't last forever. Gold and silver eventually corrodes. And we need to know that gold and silver may have value here on earth, but in heaven, they're walls and streets. It has no eternal value. What has eternal value, Peter is pointing out, is the blood of Christ. Because it's the blood of Jesus that God, that God uses to wash us and purify us from our sins and give to us a hope and a direction. And no longer are we living in futility. Because 
He's saying before salvation, our lives were empty, they were vain, they were unproductive, they were aimless. Now, when he's speaking about our, our, our aimless conduct, uh, our way of life, this aimless conduct includes our ethics and our values, our religious convictions, these things that we've inherited. Uh, these were aimless. These, these had no power. These had no effectiveness, these things. These religious things that may have made us feel better than the average person actually made us no better because, in fact, we were still lost. And our lives were aimless. Our, our lives were worthless. Our, our lives were devoid of genuine hope or promise. Remember for a moment, I don't ask you to go back there completely, but please, for just a moment, what were you like before you got saved? What was it like for you before you got saved? Mine was empty. It was futile. It was hopeless. It was lonely. I was hurting. I was using drugs and alcohol and everything that went along with it, not so much to numb, but that was the only life I knew. And it wasn't a happy life. It wasn't a good life. It wasn't an enjoyable life. It was a life that was spiraling down. It was futile. It was vain. It was empty. All I lived for was, you know, the next day that I could get high. That was it. That was my life. It was probably much like yours. That's all it was. So how, how it's hard to say. I'm trying to find words. How, the incredible amazing grace of God that, that took and transformed us from a life with no... It was aimless. We meandered. We, well, it's like this. Ephesians 2, 1, and 1 through 3. You he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in, once, in, in which you once walked. The word walk there speaks of aimless walking or meandering. You once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And we were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. We walked aimlessly from one high to the next, from one experience to the next, always looking for something fresh and something new. So we've been redeemed from that, guys. You have a purpose. We have been saved that we might enjoy God for eternity. We have a purpose, and that purpose is an eternal purpose. And how will we save, verse 19, with the precious blood of Christ? He's that lamb without blemish. He's the one without spot. We have been brought out of or bought out of slavery to sin, and the cost was the blood of Christ. When he speaks of verse 19, the precious blood, that word precious is a word that means priceless. It speaks of costly as opposed to perishable gold and silver. He's saying our release has been secured. The price has been paid by Jesus' death. And this was an incredibly high price beyond what any person could ever pay themselves. In Psalm 49, 7 and 8, none of them can by any means redeem his brother nor give to God a ransom for him for the redemption of their souls is costly. Now in verse 19, he is the lamb without blemish. He's that lamb without spot. He is the, the fulfillment of the Passover lamb. It's a, it, that, that Passover lamb was a, a picture of ransom from bondage. And notice he's a lamb without blemish. When he says he's the lamb without blemish, that's a character defect, the kind of things that you acquire in life. He's saying unstained by environment. He says without spot, no genetic or innate defect. He has no moral corruption. There was no character defect in Christ and no moral corruption within Christ. So the sacrifice made was the best, the purest, and the most costly. It was Jesus who was perfect. And he, verse 20, he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Notice this. I'll develop this for a moment with you. 
He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world. Redemption is not an afterthought. It's part of God's plan for us to be redeemed. And from eternity, before the angels and the earth was made, God already intended, because of his omniscience, to save us. And the arrangements for the atonement were made even before creation. In 2 Timothy, Paul says something like this in verse 8 through 10 in chapter 1. He says, Do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord or ashamed of me, his prisoner. Join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Now, I want to say something here. When he says in verse uh, verse 8 again through 10, he said, Join me in the suffering for the gospel by the power of God who saved us and called us to a holy life. When I first got saved, one of the things uh, about the what was called the Jesus movement or the Jesus revolution that was very unique to us um, was this sense that we have been saved out of the world and therefore we shouldn't live like it. We didn't see that as legalism. What, what has happened in our day, and I see this a lot, is that when... when when I will say something or perhaps another pastor like myself may say something about we need to be separated from these things and there are people who get uptight, you know, uh, you know, telling us what to do. Don't you understand the grace of God? It's interesting, and I don't mean this in the meanest way it sounds, and even before I say it, I think mm, that sounds mean, so I'll say it anyway, but understand I don't mean it as a mean thing, but it's interesting to me how somebody who doesn't read the Bible and has never given a Bible study can explain things to me about what we're supposed to live like through grace. And and it it always amazes me. I've been a Christian for 53 years. I've been teaching for 50 years. I've pastored this church going on 43 years. And then somebody who never reads the Bible wants to tell me that I'm legalistic because they don't understand. I had a guy say to me one time, he says, oh, you're a Christian, you can't drink because he wanted me to drink with him. He said, oh, you're a Christian, you can't drink. I said, you don't know me. I was just saved. I said, you don't know me. I can drink. I was an alcoholic for a long time, and I didn't drink just a beer. I would drink six packs. I would drink, yeah, I, I, I'm not, I, that, that sounds like I'm almost boasting, but it's just a fact. My Friday night started with a half gallon of wine and a quart of beer. That's how it started. And so, yeah, I could drink. So it was never... It was never that I couldn't. Yeah, I could. And he said it. And I was, you know, I turned 21. And and when I turned 21, law doesn't say I can't drink. So I have a friend saying, well, you're a Christian. You can't drink. And I said, no, I I can drink. Then why don't you? I said, because I don't want to drink. See, there's a difference. You know, all things may be lawful to me, but not all things build me up. I don't use my freedoms as an excuse to return to the things that I at one time had been washed from. I don't want to drink. Why not? I have no taste for it. Why is that? Because the Holy Spirit is much better. Because walking in the Spirit of the Lord is much better. I've never awakened with a Holy Spirit hangover. (laughs) You know, be ye not drunk with wine, but be ye filled with the Spirit. Why is that? Because drunkenness, he says, is a lack of self-control. And the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, is self-control. And so when you yield yourself to the power of the Holy Spirit, your life transforms. And when your life is transformed, then those old, old things that you used to, the old way you used to conduct yourself in this world is no longer attractive. There's no longer a desire for that. And it's not legalism. It's called freedom. Freedom. And I've seen people who are arguing, even in our day, for what they call as the freedoms in Christ. And, and you know, in, my, in ministry, I encounter this off and on. And sometimes I encounter this attitude with pastors. 
We have to deal with these kinds of things sometimes with fellow pastors who are using their liberty to stumble other people. And so when you were washed from your sins and all, when Christ came into your life, he, he, he transformed you and he called you to live a life that is obviously separate. It, it's a life that enjoys fellowship with God, fellowship with people, praying, worshiping, sharing the gospel with others. And I had a lady, a young lady, I was in a uh, 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 secular college and, and uh you know, she she used language and things that, that and I was 23 at the time, it was a long time ago, but she used um, language that was improper and said things improperly. And so one day she said to me something I'll never forget. She says, you treat me, she said, David, I'm a believer in Christ. I'm born again, and you treat me uh, like I'm not. And it hit me. I probably did. I probably did. You know, and... It's because I didn't think she was. I didn't, I, I, you know, I didn't see a different life in her. I didn't see in her a desire to see people saved. I didn't see in her a, an openness about her faith. I didn't see those things. Again, people, like, people, when Greg Laurie brought out the movie, The Jesus Revolution, people began to be fascinated about the Jesus movement, and some people tried to put on like they were Jesus freaks and all, and I thought that was kind of cute. But the bottom line is, is we came out of a world that hated us. I was talking to my wife today, and I said to her, before I became a Christian, um, as a hippie, the older generation didn't like me. They didn't like me because I was a hippie. I, I didn't wear shoes. Uh, I didn't cut my hair. Pastor Chuck thought hippies needed to get jobs and take baths. He, he was one of that generation, right? I said, and then when I, when I went into the military, now I'm hated by the hippies, which was true. When I went into the military, the hippies hated the military. And that's how it was when I was first saved. So you were hated by, you know, our, our, the older people, but you were also hated by the younger and what that did in me is it gave me a thick skin. And it made me say, there's one person I want to please, and that's the Lord. And the way to know how to please him, there's only one way for me to know that. It's going to be by being in the word of God. And when I'm in the word of God and I see the things that please him, those are the things I pray and say, God, help me to do that which is pleasing in your sight. So when you say that you have saved me and separated me, when you say that uh, you, have, you have saved me and, and called me to live a separated or a holy life, Lord, that's what I want to do. Because if there's anything we need right now, guys, it's an awakening in the church because the world is kicking us around like spiritual footballs because we're not speaking up for the things that matter. And so I've asked the Lord, I asked God, okay, one more thing. I, this isn't in my notes, but I'll share one more thing. One of my earliest prayers, the two early prayers, I've shared this with you. One, and I've been praying the same prayer now for over 50 years. Father, help me to learn to love people. Father, help me to learn to love people because I don't do it very well. Help me to learn to love. Two, Father, give me a spine. Give me a spine. Why did I say that? And that's, those are actual words. Father, give me a spine. Because hippies had no spines. Yeah, do whatever. You know, it doesn't matter to me. You know, we just kind of floated. It didn't matter. You want to believe that? It's cool. Just don't hurt somebody else. So when I got saved, I started saying, Father, help me to learn to love. And help me to have a strength that comes from you. Help me. And I've been praying that. For 53 years, help me to take you seriously so that I can be taken seriously by others. Help me to live a life that can impact people so that when they look at this man's life, they can say he's a follower of Christ. He knows Jesus Christ. I think that's an important thing. That's called living a separated life. 
And then finally, I'll move on and close in an hour. Um, <laughs> he says in verse 20 that Jesus was manifest in these last times for you. When he speaks of the last times, this is the period of time between the birth of Christ and his second coming. It, it, it is pointing us to God's timetable, his calendar, if you will, of events. The last times is used as a synonym for the last days. In Acts 2.17, it reads, It shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And so Jesus was manifest in this time period for us, in these last days. He has been openly revealed as our Savior in these last times. And he's saying the last age of the world has already dawned, and we know it's close. It's close is imminent. So Peter knew that things were going to wrap up really soon. And he says in these last times, he's been revealed for us. Now, others hoped to see this time. We already saw it but in other scriptures here in First Peter. But he's saying we are privileged to see it. Who, he says in verse 21, through him, through him, Believe in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Who through him, Jesus is our mediator. It is through him that we believe in God. Uh, there are people who like to post their religious beliefs, and some of you will see this in, in various postings that you have in social media. And one of the things that I see quite often, it's happening a lot lately, is people are posting things um, from, uh, from a Catholic perspective. And some of you perhaps are seeing that, but they're posting things from a Catholic perspective. And one of the things I've seen most recently, often, has been people speaking concerning the place of Mary in faith. And from a Catholic perspective, they're saying that Mary is one that we pray to. And so I was raised in the Catholic faith. I understand that. I was taught that. My mom taught me to do that. My mom, um, Sister Bonnie, I mean, she had this way about her, my mama. And she said, you know, David, she says, you need to speak to the, this is Catholic, you need to speak to the mother of God. She says, in order for him, uh, for her to take the message to God who, who, can, who can communicate that to his son Jesus. That's what I was taught. And, and she's, I'd say, I don't understand that. I still remember a conversation with mom, and she said, well, you know how when you want something and dad's at work, how that you'll tell me, and then you know I will take your words to your dad, and I'll ask on your behalf. And I said, yeah. And she says, well, that's how it is with God. You talk to his mother, and his mother will bring it to him. So I was taught that. I grew up thinking that until I got saved. And then when I got saved, I saw what Scripture said. I am the way, the truth, and life. No man comes to the Father but by me. That's what Jesus said, right? In 1 Timothy 2, verse 5, there's one God, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. There's only one mediator, and that's Jesus. It has nothing to do with his mom or, or, or uh, saints or anything like that. You see? And so through him, we believe in God who raised him from the dead. And gave him glory. So Jesus' ministry is completely validated by his resurrection from the dead. Had Jesus remained in the grave, then we would not believe anything he said. The fact that he was raised from the dead validates the message. In Romans 1 verse 4, it says, Who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the son of God. By his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. So God raised him from the dead and gave him glory by exalting him to his right hand. Now, Jesus is at the Father's right hand. He's our prince and he's our savior. In Philippians 2, verses 9 through 11, for this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, every knee and every tongue. 
If there was such a person as Buddha, he's going to bow. Muhammad is definitely going to bow. Because every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess. And that makes our Christian faith a very powerful faith. Because we believe in a God who took upon himself human flesh, dwelt amongst us, uh, enabling some to behold his glory, the glory of the only begotten Son of God, full of grace and truth. The same one who took upon himself our sin, and he bore it on a cross and was buried, and three days later rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, and sent the Holy Spirit to dwell within those who believe in him, who gave us a message to go throughout the world to proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And that's the message we take. And he has given to us the ability to know God through the Son. And that's the point that Peter's making. We have a relationship with him who through him we believe in God. And God raised him from the dead. And he's at his right hand. In Hebrews 2.9, we do see him who was made a little lower, uh, for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. So where's your faith and where's your hope? He says, your faith and your hope are in God. Even as the Lord raised Jesus, it gives us hope because we live in him. Romans 8, 11, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. And because God raised Jesus, they can live in hope no matter what they go through. And again, I mentioned this on Sunday. I, I had a... Um, email exchange with a dear friend of, of Marie and mine, Karen Johnson, who's, whose husband uh, went home to be with the Lord recently. And she wrote to me. I, I, just, I wrote her in the morning, and I said, Karen, I, I was thinking of you. I just want you to know we love you, and we're praying for you. Because she'd been with her, her husband. She'd known him since she was 13, and he was 15. So an entire life. And he was 75 when he went home to be with the Lord. So they knew each other for many years. And sometimes I wake up thinking of people, and I'll, I'll, I'll text them, and I texted her. And she wrote back, and she said, Dave, she said, thank you so much for your love, and give my love to Marie. She says, I'm, I'm seeing heaven in a, in a clearer way now, because her hope is in heaven, because she has a, 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 a glad reunion that one day she's going to experience. And over the course of the last um, few years, you know, one of the things about growing older is you see more people going home to be with Jesus, more people that you served with, more people that you loved. And it's causing me and it's causing Marie, it's causing us to see eternity in a different way. And that's what happens, isn't it? It's what happens. I bury my father, I bury my mother. And later on, I, I, I speak well of, of Jeanette Walls, who was our friend for over 40 years. And, and, and I speak well of my friend Jeff, who I knew for for 40 some years and it just makes heaven more beautiful and more ex more exciting and and more wonderful and we can we we can know we're going to heaven guys because of Jesus Jesus was raised from the dead because Jesus gave himself for us we can believe in God through him if you've seen him he told uh, Philip this if you've seen me you have seen the father how why are you saying then show us the father if you see me, you see God in human flesh. You, you know me. So we can say that, that by faith we can behold him with eyes of faith and know that one day we'll see him face to face. And that all comes because the Lord, Jesus Christ, was, uh, was, was given for us. And, and we were redeemed, not by things that perish, but by the blood of Christ. And that causes us to value him and that causes us to love him because we realize how precious he truly is and what a price he paid for us. And that's why we don't go out doing goofy and weird and sinful things anymore by habit. That's why we hate those things. That's why we, we want to live a better life, a more godly life, not only because of what it's done for us, but because of what it does for those we know like our, our mom or our dad that we can uh, encourage to have faith in Christ or the children that, that God gives to us in our Christian marriage or our grandchildren. You know, you're constantly pouring in to people, constantly encouraging them to know the Lord. Why? Because you want them to be with you when you go to heaven, right? Because you want them to be with you. And I, and I look forward to that. I look forward to having that, that reunion, that time of joy, that time of 
of no more pain and no more sorrow and no more tears and no more death, nothing, no more disease, no more, just joy everlasting in seeing the face of Christ and being with the people that you love so much and having that reunion that lasts for eternity. That's the Savior that we worship, and that's the one that we should live for daily. That's how it works. And so yeah, I'll close it with one last thought. You know, Peter was a fisherman, but he was deep. I'm telling you, as I'm reading this, I'm saying that fisherman had, he was deep. You know, the things he's just writing down. I, I have to study for hours to get just a glimpse of a little what he's trying to say. But what a God we serve. What a God we serve. And we can serve God because of Jesus.